Adonai, he said. What did he do? At that point, he realized that God was his Lord. And you cannot call God Lord unless the old man is dead. You see, every name prepares you for the coming one. When, you see, Elohim introduced you to Jehovah, Jehovah introduces us to the following name, El Shaddai. Then El Shaddai introduces us to Adonai. You can call him Lord until you're surrendered. And at that point in Genesis 18, in the first portion, he runs and says, Adonai, my Lord. And God at that point becomes Abraham's friend. You see, friendship with God develops after you recognize him as Lord. And there's so much I can say here, but for time's sake, I'll keep going. After that mighty revelation that God gives him, he asks him to do something. Now watch, watch this, Paul. This is really, really something. The minute Abraham calls him Lord, God tests him for it was after that story that God says all right if I'm Lord give me your son your only son you see God didn't ask him to give up Isaac until up to that point the second you say you're my Lord I'll tell you they'll come attest to your life and he said give me your son your only son a few years ago I saw the movie called the Bible maybe some of you saw it and it showed the story of Abraham being asked by God to give up Isaac. And Abraham went on this movie. No! I don't believe that. Amen. You know why? Because that no fellow was dead. He couldn't argue. God said, give him. And he said, yes, Lord. There was total submission to God's will. And at that point when God said, give me your son. You see, at that point, Abraham had known him as Elohim. He had known him as Jehovah. He had known him as El Shaddai. He, he had known him as Adonai, my Lord. And that's spelled A-D-O-N-A-I. And when he said, you're my Lord, he said, give me your boy. Your only son. He did. Now here's what, what happens. He takes his son, a teenager by this time, takes his servants, takes the wood, takes the donkeys, the camels, and goes. And now the Bible tells us, they're going towards the mountains of Moriah. This is marvelous. I tell you, it gets me thrilled and excited. The word Moriah means mountains of provision. Do you realize, do you realize that it was that those same spot, it was those same mountains where Jesus died? And history tells us, now whether this is true or not, I'm not sure, but history tells us that Adam was buried on the mountains of Moriah. The first man, Adam. And if that's true, that has another thing with it right here we can't get, get really into he goes towards the mountains of Moriah, which means the mountains of provision. And now his boy says this to him. And I pray to God nobody misses what I'm, what I'm about to say, because this is going to be a revelation to you. His boy says, Daddy, I see the wood. I see the fire. Where is the sacrifice? Do you, do you remember Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced? He saw it at that moment. You say, how do you know? Abraham's words in Hebrew were, listen please, Yahweh Yireh. Now remember, I know some of that language. Well, I shouldn't say some. I know a lot of it. I was born in, in, in that land. I can read the Hebrew. He said, Yahweh Yireh. You know what, what that word means? It doesn't just mean Jehovah Jireh, which means he'll, he, he will provide. It simply, it simply says, Yahweh will be seen. The word Yir'eh means he'll be seen. Look it up. He said, when, when, when Isaac said, where is the sacrifice? He said, he'll be seen. Yahweh will be seen. That same word provision has a double meaning in the Hebrew. It means to provide and to see, to see, to see. But the actual Hebrew says, Yahweh Yireh. In other words, you'll see Yahweh. Jesus said, He saw my day. Whoa, whoa. Glory to God. He said, He saw my day and He rejoiced. Now here's, here's something powerful. He takes his son Isaac. He's about to sacrifice him. 
an angel stops him, and what does he see? He says, turn around. He sees a ram, not a lamb, a ram. Well, a ram symbolizes the king. The animal, the ram, is a symbol of a king. So, again, it speaks of Jesus. Now, please hear me. We went from what? Creator, Daddy, Supplier, Lord, Revealer. See, provide, please hear me, provision is connected to revelation. You know, there's, there's a song, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And then it states, my God shall supply all my needs. I know the lady who wrote it, Nola Watson, a dear, dear friend of mine. Actually, she wrote that song with, with me standing beside her piano. That famous song. Now, as much as I love Nola, I disagree with that song. You say, how, why do you say that? Because supply and provision are not in the same act. Supply takes place at the moment of the old man's death. Provision takes place at the moment of seeing Jesus. Revelation, the revelation of the Lord brings provision. And may I say provision doesn't deal with need. It, needs, it deals with desire. The word supply, God supplies your need. He provides your desires. So the song mentions both and mixes them together, and I wish somebody would write a song and separate these two. But we can't do it, so we enjoy the song, so keep singing it. I sing it, our church sings it, because it's a wonderful song. But scripturally, somebody has to take a knife and cut it, says, this belongs here and this belongs there. But anyways, I was right there when she wrote it. I should have known this stuff back then, but I didn't. Could have told her, Mola, this doesn't fit. But I was too young in the Lord day, in those days. Provision deals with what? Revelation. When you see the Lord, he'll provide. Now, here's the wonderful thing. Abraham's story closes now, and the years pass, and we come to Moses. And when we see Moses, the first revelation that God Almighty gives to his servant Moses, please hear me now, the first revelation that God gives of himself. Now, he did give the, the great revelation of the I am. But you see, Moses could not fully understand that. Because the name I am is eternal. He, 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 he could not see the fullness of God until God began to reveal those marvelous names I'm just giving you. And so now they're out of Egypt. They've just had a marvelous miracle service when everybody was healed. They, they came out of the land of um, of bondage and the psalmist you know states when he brought them out there wasn't one feeble among them so God had must have performed a great healing service at that point and God comes and reveals himself as God your healer he says I'm Jehovah Rophe Exodus 15 you have got to hear this healing does not take place until we see Jesus See, every name prepares you for the coming event. The fifth name is he'll be seen. When he's seen, healing comes. And remember in, in the old covenant, when they looked, when they looked, they were healed. Do you remember the time when serpents bit them? The Bible says, whosoever looketh. You've got to look at Jesus to receive healing. You can't look at healing to get healing. You, you look at Jesus to get healing. Amen. See, this message can change your life if you keep listening. I hope you've got a pen and paper. Remember something. Papers never forget, so write it down. <laughs> you say, this guy talking too fast. Well, get the tape. <laughs> Call TBN or something. Okay? Now watch this. After he says, I am the Lord thy healer, which follows the revelation of, I am your provider, the one whom you see will provide, then we have the seventh marvelous revelation. After he becomes healer, the people of Israel stay stiff-necked and rebellious. But you see, God Almighty is a God of grace. So he keeps giving them victory and victory and victory and victory. Here's what, what happens. Moses now has a war with the Amalekites. Remember that war? I'm going to give you something that's going to be very, in very interesting. Keep your, your ears open, especially those of you on the East Coast. 
12 30 for you but keep your take some coffee pour it in your something stay awake I am different. Am, am, I, am, I, am I not? All right. Come here. Which camera am I on? This one or this one? There. There. Now listen carefully to me. You know, the Amalekite want, wants me to go back. I'll go back. You're out of the light. I'm out of the light. All right. Walk in the light. <laughs> Walk in the light. <laughs> Moses is fighting the Amalekites. You know who the, the Amalekites are? There are people that fought Israel for many years and then as we saw, as we see through the Bible, we find them in a battle with Saul and Saul is commanded now to destroy them. And he doesn't. He disobeys God, keeps their king Agag alive, brings him to Samuel. Samuel says, you've rejected God, therefore God is rejecting you. Not only did he keep their king Agag alive, he kept others alive for the one who killed him was an Amalekite. But here's something in really interesting. In the book of Esther, we find Haman. Haman is an Amalekite. Now, Paul, here's a very interesting thing. They did a study at the University of Jerusalem. A few years ago, you know, when the days of the hostages and so on. They wanted to know who's Khomeini, where is he from? You know what, what, what they found? He's an Amalekite. And he is a descendant of Agag. You remember that, that fellow Agag that Saul kept alive? Khomeini is his great, 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 and so many times, grandson. Get that. So the United States of America goes through years of pain, spends billions of dollars because Saul disobeys God. Isn't that amazing? How many agree it's amazing? How many, how many agree God, how many agree God knows what he's doing? And, and, and the Lord must have seen the future and the pain that the Amalekites would cause through Haman who wanted to destroy the whole nation of Israel in the, in the book of Esther. And he must have seen Khomeini. And he said, Saul, get rid of them. And he didn't do it. See, God knows the future. God doesn't like to kill people. But he likes to remove some so he, he, he can save millions. Isn't that, isn't that something? It's so interesting. Well, now Moses is fighting the Amalekites and he's holding the rod. Remember that story? And now he's getting a little tired and his hands go down and he's losing. Hands pick up, he's winning. And at that point, God gives him a revelation. You see, he was first Elohim and then we went from there to Jehovah to El Shaddai, to Adonai, to Jehovah Jireh, to Jehovah Rophe. By the way, that was the six which I never gave you, did I? I told you he's your healer, but I didn't give you that Hebrew word. That's Jehovah Rophe. R-O-P-H-E. E-H. Now Moses is standing with his rod up, and the revelation comes, and the seventh revelation comes, and God says, I am Jehovah Nissi, your victory. Victory always follows the supernatural. You see, in Jehovah Rophe, we have the supernatural, the healing power of God. You cannot have victory without the supernatural. You can't have the supernatural without sight, seeing the provider. You, you can't see him unless he's your Lord. I mean, it, it just, every name prepares the next one. The eighth revelation, still with Moses, he's walking through the wilderness. The people of Israel are still rebellious. May I have some water? <laughs> They're still rebellious. But you know what God says? God says, if you'll obey me, if you'll listen to me, I'll be your sanctifier. I'll sanctify you. And he introduces himself there in the eighth name of Jehovah Mikadesh. I'll sanctify you. You know, he was, he was offering holiness to a people who were stiff-necked. And there's a lot more here I can say, but for time's sake, let me keep going. Then the years go by. He comes again, and, and the ninth revelation given again to the people of Israel through Moses. He says, he says, I'll tell you what. He says, I'll put my righteousness in you. All you have to do is just love me and obey me. And there he introduced himself as Jehovah Sidkenu, our righteousness. But they didn't want that either. At that point, the story of Moses closes. And we move on from there, and we find after Moses, now, 